Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the ninth of the second month on our Creator's calendar, which happens to line up with April 22nd, 2023, on the Gregorian calendar. And we are continuing with our reading and study of the book of Hanak, or what they call First Enoch. Last time we finished, we went through up to chapter 72, which covers the main focus or the main part of how the calendar functions with the luminary, the greater light or the sun. And now we're getting into some of how other aspects of the, the luminaries work and then the, the winds and the quarters and things like that. So Ob willing, we'll be able to get through this today and then next week or perhaps later on, uh, we will fully show the rest of how it goes together because what you can find in this book in particular about the lum the lesser light or the moon is an abridged version of what you can find in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the things that it mentions here, while somewhat on point, isn't exactly accurate, doesn't line up with reality fully with how we can we can see it outside. When you compare what's in the Dead Sea Scrolls and you can see what's missing, and then you line that up, which men have done, Jerry Morris being the first that I know of in 2016, he has a video on YouTube, possibly still on his YouTube channel, but he passed away a few years ago. In there, he was showing that how the calendar pointed out when the moon was full throughout a three-year period, he tracked in almost an entire year, and everything that was written in it he found to be true in reality. And it's when you line up how the moon functions over a three-year period in relation to the yearly 364-day yearly cycle of the sun, you'll find that it's a repeatable pattern that you can follow. And he was doing this since 2013. I've been doing this since 2016. And a lot of the people in our group here have been following along after that time as well where you've seen where it's a full moon on the first of the year at least once or twice and then you can literally track that throughout the three-year period for every full moon every crescent or dolk new moon if you will or not new moon sorry that the chodesh was the full or new moon the the full moon and then the dolk dalif wa kuf or dalit wa kuf Hey, Doka is where it's just a minute, exact, looking intently sliver, right? It means to be small, to look exactly, to be precise. And that's when you're looking for the crescent, right? So you can see that throughout one of the scrolls where it tracks it for a three-year setting, and you can actually line that up with reality, which is what we try to do to the best of our ability. And again, we went over that before. It's one of the three pillars of how you can know the three witnesses to establish that you're on the right track for what day it is. Otherwise, you're just relying on one witness. If you just go by just the sun or just the moon. You can also do things where you're going by the sun and moon, but in a different manner, following your own inclinations instead of what's actually written, which is what... Um, it's what Catholicism does. They they go by the first full moon after the vernal equinox to show when Easter is. And they have some perverted ideas of when everything is because Satan's a liar. He doesn't even speak and deal truly with his own. The higher up you go, the more you're deceived in different ways. And you see that very same pattern. I don't, I don't mean to go on a, a, a tangent here, but I'm trying to point out he's the, the ruler of this world. And our educational systems have been corrupted by satanic influences. They don't teach the truth anymore. There was a lady that quit being a um, quit going for her doctorate in physics when she realized in college that the entirety of her life in school, she was just lied to differently as she grew about how uh, physics and atom uh, atomics worked. And to even when she was in college, they weren't teaching an actual known proven thing but it was theories and lies and, and figments of people's imaginations. So that same thing happens in how they deal with everything. And you can do that with when does a day, what, what, is a, what does the world say when a day starts in the middle of the night? 
right? When is when does the year start? In the middle of winter. Everything's backwards and wrong because he's a liar. He's the father of them. But continuing here, we are on chapter 73. And it starts off, it says, and after this law, with the, the luminary, with the sun, the great light, right? And after this law, I saw another law dealing with the smaller luminary, which is called or named the moon. And her circumference is like the circumference of the Shemayim, meaning a circle. And her chariot in which she rides is driven by the wind. And light is given to her in measure and her rising and setting change every month and her days are like the days of the sun and when her light is uniform i.e full it amounts to a the seventh part of the light of the sun so the full moon is seven times less light than the sun when we have the consummations of the times beginning and our Mashiach returns, the moon will be seven times brighter than it is. So it will be as bright as the sun and the sun many fold more brighter itself. And then after those times, it says that the moon will be no more. And after the, after Satan's taken away, all of creation is, uh, he's released again after the millennial reign. And he causes the nations to rise up against his people and surround and take out the land or to try to destroy them all. The father will rain down fire. Everyone that's in, in that area at the time within his protection will be protected and everything else will be consumed. The, the firmament, the earth, everything. And it'll be a desolate wasteland. Then you'll have the general resurrection or the great white throne judgment resurrection in which everyone for a week of years will be judged according to their ways and deeds. The righteous that were part of the first resurrection and those that were living that were changed into the messengers will not face the second death. But everyone that was brought up at that time will either be consigned to the lake of fire or to eternity of unspeakable good. But at that point, the light of the moon will be no more. It won't exist after that time. And if you recall what the moon represents or the, the kingdom, it's after that time that our Mashiach will yield up the authority to his father and he himself will dwell with men with our Mashiach in the world of the new creation in which righteousness dwells and there's no more tears, sorrow, sadness, or sin ever. <clears throat> This is in her rising and setting change every month. We'll get into this a little more in detail, but based on the luminary changes, it has 15 days of waxing, 15 days of waning. Generally, it changes throughout the year, 29 and 30, 29 and 30, right? And then during the time when it's waxing and waning, it will actually go through different gates and appear in different gates than the sun during its cycle. Because as we went through that, it starts in the fourth gate, works towards the fifth, towards the sixth, again in the sixth, fifth, fourth, third, first, or second, first, and then first, second, third, and starts the year again. The moon doesn't go in that pattern, but it'll skip and jump and hop around in what gate it's perceived in, which is really if you're standing in one spot and you look to the east, you're going to find it in different locations depending on what, what phase it's in. That's pretty much what you're. He's trying to describe. What's the Hebrew definition of gate? Uh, it's the same as a door, but that's a good question. I have to get back to you on that. Uh, hold on. The twelve gates of the four quarters. I'd have to look at the Hebrew on that one too. Just one moment. All right. So we looked it up real quick, and just for everyone's knowledge the word for gate that's used in the astronomical enoch or the the Hanok of the dead sea scrolls in particular 4q 209 and 4q 208 
is Tau Resh Ayin Aleph, which they usually have an Aleph at the end of a word. They say that's Aramaic. So it could just be this is an Aramaic version of the Hebrew word, or you could drop that Aleph and just have Tau Resh Ayin. Or that could be how it's actually spelled, but we'll look that up. We'll get in. We'll get into the dictionary and we'll find out what those words mean, like if it literally means a gate, or if there's a different meaning to it. And then we'll put that in the description for anyone that wants to look. Okay. But to continue here, it says, "In her rising or her coming and going change every month, and her days are like the days of the sun." And when her light is uniform, it amounts to the seventh part of the light of the sun. And thus she rises or comes. And her first phase in the east comes forth on the 30th morning. This part right here does not make sense when you look at everything that's written. I, I don't know exactly the context. We're just going to read through it. But her first phase... comes or in the east comes forth on the 30th morning and on that day she becomes visible and constitutes for you the first phase of the moon on the 30th day together with the sun in the portal where the sun rises this could be meaning that she goes through an entire phase of of being from full to dark to full again within 30 days and this is true when you look at the calendar, we'll do that real quick. On the the first of the the fourth or the first of the year, every third year, you have a full moon on the first day, and on the thirtieth day. And you can it, that happens every third year. It'll do that. When whenever you have Gamal serving in the first week or Shekin Yahu number twenty two or number ten in the order, you'll have the full moon on the first, and correspondingly, it will also be on the thirtieth. And that could be what it's talking about, where it goes through its complete phase in thirty days. But again, we don't have enough context in just what's written there to know for certain. That's what makes sense to me, but that doesn't mean that's exactly what it was trying to say. So it says, and thus she comes, and her first phase in the east comes forth on the 30th morning. And on that day she becomes visible and constitutes for you the first phase of the moon on the 30th day together with the sun in the portal where the sun rises. And the one half of her goes forth by a seventh part. And her whole circumference is empty without light with the exception of one-seventh part of it, the fourteenth part of her light. And when she receives one-seventh part of the half of her light, her light amounts to one-seventh part and the half thereof. And she said, this doesn't make sense very well, but when you look at how it's described here and elsewhere, it starts off full or it starts off dark or just with a crescent. And that's considered one seventh of half or one fourteenth. The next night, it'll be two sevenths or two fourteenths. And then you'd have one or half seventh and a full seventh. I don't, they, they switch between those two things, but every night you'd have a little more illumination for 14 nights until it's full. And then for another 15, it goes down until it's dark. And that first month, you have um, 29 day or night cycle for the moon. The next one, you'd have 30. The next one, you have 29. And it keeps back and forth throughout the year exactly like that. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it goes through that for a three-year period before it repeats itself. You can see that here as well and as we read later on. But it mentions that the moon makes a cycle for a year in 200 or 354 days the sun as we had already read a few weeks ago in chapter 72 
And it's also mentioned in the Obelim, and it's mentioned throughout the Dead Sea Scrolls in a variety of places. But the, the sun makes a, a cycle in 364 days only. So there's 10 days off from the lunar year and a solar year, if you will. The next year, the moon is 20 days off. And the third year, it's 30 days off, which is a month. And that's where you get the um, the second Adar in the lunar calendars where they add a 13th month to keep in sync with the seasons. But that's not something we're told to do. It is a phenomenon of the moon that you can see in reality, however. It says, and she sets with the sun. And when the sun rises, the moon rises with him and receives the half of one part of light. Like it was saying, out of seven seven parts, it would be half of a seventh, then one seventh, then one, one and a half of a seventh, and then two sevenths, instead of saying one fourteenth, for whatever reason. And in that night, in the beginning of her morning, in the commencement of the lunar day, the moon sets with the sun, and is invisible that night with the 14 parts and the half of one of them. So when it's a crescent and it's just when it's waning crescent, it's close to where the, the luminary of the sun is. And as the sun sets, the moon goes with it. And then you're without the moon for the, the most of that night. This is what it's trying to describe. And she rises on that day with exactly a seventh part and comes forth and recedes from the rising of the sun or coming of the sun. And in her remaining days, she becomes bright in the 13 parts, meaning a little bit more every single night until full. And each time, that's what you, they say is the retrograde from the, the moon and the sun, where every night it's 11 degrees further off from where the sun is as it's gaining a portion of its light. Chapter 74, and I saw another course, a law for her, how according to that law she performs her monthly revolution, and all these Oriel, or the light of El, the set-apart messenger who is the leader of them all, showed to me, and their positions, and I wrote down their positions as he showed them to me, and I wrote down their months, as they were, and the appearance of their lights till fifteen days were accomplished. In single seventh parts, she accomplishes all her light in the east, and in single seventh parts accomplishes all her darkness in the west. Now, if you pay attention to the, the month, or as the moon goes, you can literally watch it diminish or increase as the sun rises or sets in comparison to it at those appointed at those times in the east or the west respectively and this is what he's trying to describe things you can visually witness with your own eyes all right and then we are on chapter verse four this is and in certain months she alters her settings and in certain months, she pursues her own peculiar course. Like I was mentioning, she doesn't stay in the same gates as the sun. In two months, the moon sets with the sun. And in those two middle portals, the third and the fourth, she goes forth for seven days and turns about and returns again through the portal where the sun comes and accomplishes all her light. And she recedes from the sun and in eight days enters the sixth portal from which the sun goes forth. All right, so verse five, it says, In two months the moon sets with the sun in those two middle portals, the third and the fourth. She goes forth for seven days and turns about and returns again through the portal where the sun rises or comes and accomplishes all her light. And she recedes from the sun and in the eight days enters the sixth portal from which the sun goes forth. 
And when the sun goes forth from the fourth portal, she goes forth seven days until she goes forth from the fifth and turns back again in the seven days into the fourth portal and accomplishes all her light. And she recedes and enters into the first portal in eight days. And she returns again in seven days into the fourth portal from which the sun goes forth. Thus, I saw their position, how the moon comes or rose and the sun set in those days. And if five years are added together, the sun has an overplus of 30 days, and the moon or, and all the days which occur to it for one of those five years, when they are full, amount to 364 days. This part does not quite make sense to me. The rest of it makes more sense, especially with how it actually lines up with reality and the rest of what's written. But if you add five years together, you're going to have a total of 50 days difference between them. Not not 30. So I'm not sure how what that's supposed to mean. Uh, the, the information thus far given is for what purpose? If we want to get specific on our worship days, holy days, uh, I mean, information has purpose. What is purpose? For this, she asks us in the Psalms, "Teach us to number our days, so that we turn unto you." Right? We're we're not supposed to let our appointed times go beyond where they're supposed to be, not before or after. It mentions in other places, and all of this information about how the sun works, how the moon works, and the seasons. It's all so that you can keep on track with when reality actually says these days are. That's why I was saying that you have to have it make sense. It has to be meshing with what's in the other scrolls in reality. If you can't find how this works in reality, then how does that help you? It has to this be. This is just verification. Hmm? A witness. It's exactly. verification or a witness. Exactly. And this is what uh, like our brother Jerry Morris did. Other people, our brother Andrew. Collins, right? He's been doing this from Britain when he has an opportunity. But you can look in particular in what's in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, it says the book from Yahweh's sword has 50 days in verse 10. Right. So you see there, there's differences between verses and versions as well, but that would make more sense as well. And sometimes there's typos. But um, the, the point is if you look at this information, you should be able to take what is written, look in the sky and see that it actually lines up. It's it's actually true. And you can't do that with all of the information here sometimes because it's an abridged or it's a deficient version. It's been muddied down through time and, and translations. Uh, you, you can find that. We'll get to it more, but we've already talked about that before. In particular, the best example I can find for anyone, read the Testament of Louis or Levi chapter 1 and chapter 2 from the Greek version, and then read that same section from the Aramaic version that was found in Geniza or the Dead Sea Scrolls. And you'll find in the Greek version, it mentions just one little sentence. It says, and I prayed, and then he has a vision. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, it says, and he prayed, and he went, and he washed his hands, he made sure he had clean garments, he wasn't doing anything, he got his heart right, and then it actually says the prayer, which is a very long one that he actually said. And you don't get any of that in what we commonly have as his testament. In the very same way, the lunar information that you get from the book of Hanok, or First Enoch, is an abridged version of the wealth of information you have in the Dead Sea Scrolls that fully encompass it. And even that one has some typos. It has some, some issues in it because men are fallible. There's fragments. It's not complete. You have to piece it together for one. And there's actually a section that overlaps and repeats itself because the scribe that was doing it just made a mistake. And so you have there's a whole section that's just repeated, but once you correct it, then everything makes sense. And people have done that. 
not only, you know, if you read the new translation, the, the commentary in there talks about it. They've done this themselves, even if they don't believe it, but they talk about it. Other people have done that and confirmed it as well. So right here, the idea that the moon goes back 10 days is what is the gist of what you see here. And then it goes on to that, but it does not tell you that you have that third year sink where there's a full moon on the first of the year. It doesn't mention this at all in the book of Hanok. You have to find that in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But it says uh, right here, verse 11, and the overplus of the sun and of the stars amounts to six days. In five years, six days, every year come to 30 days. And the moon falls behind the sun and stars to a number of 30 days. And the sun and the stars bring in all the years exactly so that they do not advance or delay their position by a single day unto eternity, but complete the years with perfect righteousness in 364 days. A lot of people will take this particular section and use that to say that the stars and the sun stay in line, but that's disproven in reality. From the beginning, and you have historical records, you have what we can visibly see and that's recorded within our lifetimes, as well as what's known about how they correspond with each other. It's what they call the procession of the equinox, where the solar equinox has been shifting what constellation it's been in since the beginning of time. In the Good News accounts, it mentions that he sends his taught ones two by two before him into every city and place in which he was going to go. And that's a reflection of how the stars travel faster than the sun, which is what you can literally observe in reality too. So if you look up the procession of the equinoxes, if you look up what they call the sidereal or sidereal day, and you... You can crunch the numbers and do the math. I've done this before. But you'll find out that the Gregorian calendar literally follows the stars. You can get any modern star chart and you can look at what day, what month, what exact hour it is on the Gregorian calendar. And you'll be able to see and know what stars will be overhead because it's keyed to it. You can't do that with just the sun because they don't go the same speed. And that's known in science, it's not a new phenomenon, but it makes things like this not make any sense and cause confusion. If you know that they do complete each other and the, the difference between them, what scripture says about it, then it does make perfect sense. But you won't have the beginning, you won't have the equinox or the beginning of the year with the same constellations all the time. It just doesn't happen. Just because, just like you don't have every year exactly repeating the same things over and over again, time flows, history flows, and his luminaries flow, revealing the things that are to come. This is the whole point and purpose. It's mentioned in places throughout scripture. The most clear, I believe, is in the recognitions of Clement. This is in three years, there are 1,092 days. And in five years, 1,820 days, so that in eight years, there are 29 or 2,912 days. For the moon alone, the days amount to three years to 1,062 days. And in five years, she falls behind, or she falls 50 days behind, i.e., to the sum of 1,770 days. There is to be added 1,062 days. So you can see he's just trying to point out every year it's 10 days further back compared to the luminary or the, the sun. And in five years, there are 1,770 days so that for the moon, 
the days or eight year or the days in eight years amount to 2,832. For in eight years, she falls behind to the amount of 80 days, 10 days a year. All the days she falls behind in eight years are 80. And the year is accurately completed in conformity with their world stations and the stations of the sun, which rise from the portals through which it, it the sun rises and sets for 30 days. All right, just one moment. All right, and now we're on chapter 75, which kind of segues and goes into a little bit different way of describing some of these things. And the leaders of the heads of the thousands who are placed over the whole creation and over all the stars have also to do with the four intercalary days, being inseparable from their office, according to the reckoning of the year. And these render service on the four days which are not reckoned in the reckoning of the year. And owing to them, men go wrong therein. For those luminaries truly render service on the world stations, one in the first portal, one in the third portal of the Shemayim, one in the fourth portal, or gate, and one in the sixth portal. And the exactness of the year is accomplished through its separate 364 stations. For the signs and the times and the years and the days, the messenger Oriel showed to me, whom Yahuwah of esteem has set over or has set forever over all the luminaries of the Shemaim, in the Shemaim and in the world, that they should rule on the face of the Shemaim and be seen on the earth and be leaders for the day and the night i.e. the sun, moon, and stars, and all the ministering creatures which make the revolution in all the chariots of the Shemaim. In like manner, twelve doors or gates Oriel showed me, corresponding with the twelve constellations, open in the circumference of the, the sun's chariot in the Shemaim through which the rays of the sun break forth. And if you're familiar with the, the, the constellations and the, you have the ring or the circle of the 12, the, the called the zodiac, and then you'll have the ecliptic or the circuit of the sun that goes through them throughout the year. And this is what's trying to be explained right here. Okay. And from them is warmth diffused over the earth when they are opened at their appointed seasons. And for the winds and the ruach of the dew, when they are opened, standing open in the Shemaim at the ends. As for the twelve portals in the Shemaim, at the ends of the earth, out of which go forth the sun, moon, and stars, and all the works of Shemaim in the east and in the west. There are many windows open to the left and right of them, and one window at its season produces warmth, corresponding to those doors from which the stars come forth, according as he has commanded them, and wherein they set, corresponding to their number. And I saw the chariots in the Shemaim running in the world, above those portals in which revolve the stars that never set. And one is larger than all the rest, and it is that that makes its course through the entire world. Now, Scripture mentions that the stars are no longer possible to be seen because of the brightness of the sun, but that doesn't mean that they're not visible anymore. Where the sun is in what constellation, it's going through that window and empowering that influence in the world. The sun empowering the moon and stars, which also nourish and help everything below it. The moon specifically is for the nourishment and growth of all the living. 
as is mentioned in scripture. And for anyone that's familiar with farming or planting and things of that nature, you plant certain things at a full moon, you plant other things at a dark moon, whether it's waxing or waning, they have different things that you um, would put in the ground at those times for their benefit and for its best growth. I'm not very familiar with that, but that's literally how it works where the moon is for the nourishment and growth of everything that lives. Uh, the And its influence again from the sun. So the same way that you see our Mashiach works in reality, the luminaries, which are a type and picture, function in reality. Chapter 76. And the leaders of the heads of the thousands who are placed over the whole creation and over all the stars have also to do with the four intercalary days being inseparable from their office according to the reckoning of the year. And these render service on the four days which are not reckoned in the reckoning of the year. A lot of people get caught up on this as well. He mentions that twice that they're not reckoned in the reckoning of the year, but he mentions right here that they're truly part of it, right? And they truly render service. Okay, in 364 days, a lot of people will say that the calendar is only 360 days and you don't literally count the four intercalary days where they, they talk about that. Right. And I don't mean to. Just so we can see. Oh, no, hold on. I wanted to get back to where we were before with the calendar. There we go. Sorry about that. So the longest day of the year, the equal day and night. The shortest day of the year and the equal day and night. These are the four days that they say are not numbered or they're not counted. And the only context we have for that throughout scripture is in the capacity of foretelling. Where you have the times, times, and half a time. Or when you have the years of foretelling and how it leads up to days, a day for a year. When you're doing that just like when they talk about the flood during the time of Noah, five months being 150 days, or in the time of Hadasha or Esther, when she was being purified for six months or 180 days, you don't find these intercalary days mentioned, although it's literally 151 and 182. So... That's the context that's being spoken of. It's literally part of the year. You literally add it. It's 364 days that repeats without fail. But when it's talking about it in scripture, when it's mentioning foretellings and things of that nature, it goes with 360. And that's the meaning of that. I haven't found it anywhere else where there's a different context. But it says, in owing to them, men go wrong therein. For those luminaries truly render service on the world stations, one in the first portal, one in the third portal of the Shemayim. I already read that one, sorry. No, there, it's repeating itself. I'm sorry, let me finish. One in the third portal of the Shemayim, one in the fourth portal, and one in the sixth portal. And the exactness of the year is accomplished through its separate 364 stations. For the signs and the times and the years and the days, the messenger Oriel showed to me, whom Yahuwah of esteem has set over or set forever over all the luminaries of the Shemaim, in the Shemaim and in the world, that they should rule on the face of the Shemaim and be seen on the earth and be leaders for the day and the night, i.e. the sun, moon, and stars and all the ministering creatures which make their revolution in all the chariots of the Shemaim. If you're curious about what it means when it says that they're in the Shemaim and in the world, I'll give you two examples. The forerunner of our Mashiach was Yahukanon the Immerser, who they call the uh, the bright and morning star, right? Or he was the, like, 
what you'd see in Venus, how sometimes that star precedes the sun and you can watch it. And even after the sun rises, see it for a time before it fades away. That's a picture of the, the morning star or the, uh, the, the luminary that was the forerunner to the sun, like Yahukanon before he was a martyr. And you see the very same thing in history, especially if you if you watch the anti-Christ or anti-Mashiach for dummies videos. It was, I believe it was Wycliffe that was known as the morning star of the Reformation, where he preceded the coming of that light. So these are the things where it mentions in, in the sky and on the earth, the men that walk it out, the luminaries, the children of light, and our Mashiach being like the bridegroom or the sun, and, or, which is the truth. When the truth came from the Reformation, he preceded it in that capacity. Okay? So that they should rule over the face of the Shemaim and be seen on earth and be leaders for the day and the night, i.e. the sun, moon, and stars, and all the ministering creatures which make the revolution in the chariots of the Shemaim. In like manner, twelve doors Oriel showed me open in the circumference of the sun's chariot in the Shemaim, through which the rays of the sun break forth, meaning the sun goes through the constellations of the zodiac throughout a year. And from them is warmth diffused over the earth when they are opened at their appointed seasons. And for the winds and the ruach of the dew, when they are opened, standing open in the Shemaim at the ends. As for the twelve portals in the Shemaim at the ends of the earth, out of which go forth the sun, moon, and stars, and all the works of Shemaim in the east and in the west. There are many windows open to the left and right of them, and one window at its season produces warmth corresponding to those doors from which the stars come forth according as he has commanded them, and wherein they set corresponding to their number. And I saw chariots in the Shemaim running in the world, above those portals in which revolve the stars that never set. And one is larger than all the rest, and it is that that makes its course through the entire world. I mean, there's one star, like the Southern Cross, they call it, which goes at its extremity around the entirety of the, the circuit of the firmament. It's the furthest circuit out, if you will, right? So Ob willing, this isn't too confusing to you, but where the sun and the moon go through, where the, con the zodiac constellations are generally, the stars are all over the place, and they open in the windows to the left and right of them as well as on there, which is what it's trying to explain. As the sun sets or sun rises, the, the stars will appear or disappear and fade away from the sky. Those are the windows that it goes through. If and this is for people who are more familiar with it. This might be over the head of a lot of individuals, but uh, just for context here. The luminaries that we see are projections. They're brought into the world from above. And you can actually, if anyone's recorded or watched the 2017 solar eclipse, where a university had put a balloon up with 360 degree cameras, you were able to watch a tidally locked star in sync with the sun that was moving with it. And when that star dimmed and faded, the eclipse happened. And when it was, when it was being brought back, it, the, the sun appeared again, like it was a projection and a lens was covering it and then being removed. All the luminaries in the firmament, within the firmament, are projections like that, coming from the Father of Lights. Above the firmament, you also have stars, which we've already read in the book of Hamak. It explained it a little bit, but you still see the stars in the ceiling and the lightnings and things of that nature. That's where these luminaries actually are, and they're revolving in their chariots that is being projected into the world. That's what they're trying to explain there. Chapter 77. At the ends of the earth I saw twelve portals open to all the quarters of the Shemaim. 
from which the winds go forth and blow over the earth. Three of them are open on the face, i.e. east of the Shemaim, and three in the west, and three on the right, i.e. the south of the Shemaim, and three are on the left, i.e. north. All right, so just real quick, when he's explaining that he's facing east, and then to his right is the south, to his left is the north, and behind him is the west, this is what he's perceiving. No matter where you stand, that's going to be true. When he talks about where these windows are, they're at the extremity. So when you're facing this way, and he says the first or to the east, you have the windows that open one, two, three. Then you have three in the north, one, two, three, three in the west, one, two, three, and three in the south, one, two, three. And depending on how many windows are open that lets in the winds, different things are happening, which is what he's about to explain. Another way to see that is right here. You don't have the uh, you don't have the the directional cardinal directions, but you get the same thing. If you're pointed here and you're looking east. Or if you're right here in the Middle East and you're looking east, the extremity of the east is right here. One, two, three. Then to your left would be the north. One, two, three. Then you'd have to your right, the south. One, two, three. And then behind you to the west. One, two, three. And these are where the, the gates or the windows open for the winds which are in his treasuries that blow forth. And if you remember, wind and ruach, or spirit, is synonymous. So it's through his ruach that he sends pestilence, baraka. It's, it's not by might or by power, but through his ruach that he does these things. And it's literally the influences of the winds blowing in the world that bring baraka or cursing, which is what he's about to get into. So we'll continue reading now. <clears throat> and... Our sister just let me know I had chapter 76, which I read right here, which was a repeat of the one I just read up there in 75. So I, I copied that and made it twice. I'm sorry. We did literally repeat ourselves, but this is the actual chapter 76 right here. Okay. And he says, at the ends of the earth, I saw 12 portals open to all quarters of the Shemaim. From which the winds go forth and blow, or the Ruachoth go forth and blow over the earth. Three of them are open on the face, i.e. the east of the Shemaim. And it's the face because it's the way he's facing, right? And three in the west, and three on the right, i.e. the south of the Shemaim. And three are on the left, i.e. the north. And the three first are those, if you also pay attention, that's the way the, the, the circuit of the sun goes. Starts in the east, heads through the south to the west, and then goes to the north to come back to the east again. As it explained in chapter 72, it's also in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, and it might be mentioned elsewhere. Verse 3 says, And the three first are those of the east, and three are of the north, and three after those on the left of the south, and three of the west. Through four of these come winds of Baraka, or blessing, and prosperity, and from those eight come hurtful winds when they are sent. They bring destruction on all the land and on the water upon it, and on all who dwell thereon, and on everything which is in the water and on the land. And the first wind from those portals, called the east wind, comes forth through the first portal which is in the east, inclining towards the south. From it comes forth desolation, drought, heat, and destruction. I was just reminded, if you want to see a real real excellent example, 
of how the winds work in creation. There was a brother, he passed away, his name's Rob Skiba, but he had the he had a lot of information about uh, studying flat earth. And one of the things he got was the, the from the US government geological survey online where they had the azimuthal map and it showed the wind and, and water patterns. And when you put the flat earth map on there, you can see how the, the winds work and it just, it looks perfectly makes sense. It also helps you see how tornadoes work and why they are hurricanes and they spin certain directions depending on where it's at in sync with the sun. And uh, the stuff makes more sense when you look at that. If I can find it again, I'll go ahead and put it in the description and I'll share with everybody as well, just so you can get a visual. Eventually, when they when this was starting to be pointed out by him and others, they changed that map to where it was a globe and you had to toggle a slide to try to get it in the azimuthal section. And I believe afterwards, later on, they just completely removed that part. So you can't do it. You can only look at it like it's on a globe. But I might be mistaken on that point. I haven't looked at it for a while. So to continue here, and this is talking about how the winds affect creation, depending on which ones are open in what direction, right? And through the second portal, in the middle comes what is fitting. And from it, there come rain and fruitfulness and prosperity and dew. And through the third portal, which lies toward the north, come cold and drought. And after these come forth the south winds through three portals. Through the first portal of them, inclining to the east, comes forth a hot wind. And through the middle portal next to it, there come forth fra fragrant smells and dew and rain and prosperity and health. And through the third portal, Lying to the west come forth dew and rain, locusts and desolation. And after these, the north winds. From the seventh portal in the east come dew and rain, locusts and desolation. And from the middle portal come in a direct direction, health and rain and dew and prosperity. And through the third portal in the west come cloud and hoarfrost and snow and rain and dew and locusts. And after these four are the west winds. Through the first portal adjoining the north come forth dew and hoarfrost and cold and snow and frost. And from the middle portal come forth dew and rain, and prosperity and baraka. And through the last portal, which adjoins the south, come forth drought and desolation, and burning and destruction. So if we were careful with these and we plotted it out on the Gleason map, you should be able to get what doors or which ones based on what it says. Like the middle portion, portal is the one that's in between the two. The one that's adjoined to the south would be the, the one that was next to the southern portals from the west, like you're going in a clockwise fashion, right? I'm willing that makes sense to you. Otherwise, we'll, we'll go over it into more detail later. But just to get an idea for what's being written here. <clears throat> All right, verse 14. It says, and the 12 portals of the four quarters of the Shemaim are therewith completed, and all their laws and all their plagues and all their benefactions have I shown to you, my son Methuselah. And chapter 78, which is will probably be the last chapter for today, but this has, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you get the Hebrew or Aramaic, if you will, versions of these words in the etymology, which is the earliest known etymology for any of these words in Hebrew where it's actually explained, which I thought was very interesting. The text is a little different between what you might read in a, in an older version or um, 
a different translation and what you can find in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the meaning of it and why it's there. But I, I added that here and we're just going to read through it, okay? It says, and the first quarter is called Kadim, Kuf Dalit Yod Mim, which is east. The word Kadem, Kuf Dalit Mem, means to be first, to be east, set of the rising of the sun. And it also means before or to bore through something to get ahead of it. But it says in the first quarter is called Kadim, east, because it is Kadme, first. The second, I didn't put the, I'm sorry, it, it should be Dorim or Dorem. I want to make sure I pronounce that right. So the second is called Dorom, Dirom, right here. Dirom or south, because the Most High will dwell, door, there. The word for dwelling is door or dar. And that's also the word for a generation. It means to go in a circle and come back. But it's where he dwells. There, yea, there in quite a special sense, will he who is Baruch forever dwell. And this is like you see from the sun. It comes first from the east and then it dwells throughout the day. It, throughout the south it goes south and then heads back to the west right and a great quarter ma arav west is named mean aravin diminished because there all the luminaries of the shamayim wane and go down and in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it says it, that it's called Ma'arav because there the stars of Shemaim go. Hundreds setting mean Aravin and hundreds entering, all of them stars. Accordingly, he called it West. It says, in the fourth quarter, named Zipun, Zipun, North, because all ships of the Shemaim. Zephin, or hide there. And Zephun and Zephin means to go to the north, to hide, to conceal, also to code or decode, right? And it's said of the setting of the sun. These are all literal definitions from Ernest Klein's Etymological Dictionary of the Hebrew Language for Readers of English, which is published by Carta, Jerusalem. It says, uh, because all of the ships of the Shemayin Zephin or Hyde, it says, is divided into three parts, the north being divided into three parts. The first of them is for the dwelling of men. The second contains seas of water and the abysses and forests and rivers and darkness and clouds. And the third part contains the garden of righteousness. I've shared this before, but just for everyone to see, we can get the three norths right here. The first north is the dwelling of men, where men dwell in the northern latitudes of the world, right? The second north is the seas and the waters and the rain, the clouds, okay, all, all this area. And then the third north is the Garden of Righteousness, which I don't know if I have Mercator's map on here, but if we do, I will try to find it real quick. Give me just one moment. All right, just so everyone can see, this is called the Mercator map, and you can look these up as well. There's two versions. This one was the original that he had gotten. He corresponded with a gentleman named John D, and they were both going over a writing from a something for Tunita. I can't remember the exact thing, but it was someone who was using magic to travel through these areas because you can't get out. Once you go in these inflowing rivers, you can't get out with a boat. Once you get within here, you're magnetically locked. Any iron nails or whatever you had on there is pulling you right towards that that rock. But and that's a phenomenon they they record and talk about. But 
the, the used magic and he got around and he saw all this stuff and he wrote about it in his book. There's another gentleman named Olaf who went in here with his father, went down into the into the earth, met some giants and had an amazing adventure and then left. His father died, but he lived to tell the tale. Um, this is the original. And then you also have this version, which came out later after this part of the mountain range at the 73rd parallel there was sunk underwater. And now Greenland is no longer connected with this section. This part of every map is what they call, what I believe the four flowing rivers, the Garden of Eden, right? It's a picture of it. And you don't find this in any modern maps or, or, or mentioned at all anymore. In some of the older versions of different maps, you can find it though. So that's what I was talking about, about the center of the earth. Yeah. All right, so again, just to recap, where you saw Greenland right here, it would have been connected at one point. And then that whole section that's no longer on any map, modern map today, would be right here. And then you had that water basin that I mentioned. Here would be Alaska and Russia, China, go along into Europe, and it's all connected. So this is where that would be. And right in the center there is where that magnetic mountain is. And that's what every compass in the world generally points towards. And that would be the third part that contains the Garden of Righteousness. I saw seven high mountains higher than all the mountains which are on the earth, and thence comes forth hoarfrost, and days, seasons, and years pass away. I saw seven rivers on the earth larger than all the rivers. One of them coming from the west pours its waters into the great sea. And these two come from the north to the sea and pour their waters into the Erethian Sea in the east. If uh, the Erethian Sea is the sea between, it's the Sea of Arabia. It's over south of the land in between Egypt and Arabia there. That's what the Greeks called it. And the remaining four come forth on the side of the north to their own sea, two of them to the Erethian Sea, and two into the Great Sea, and discharge themselves there, and some say, into the desert, or the wilderness, right? Seven great islands I saw in the sea and in the mainland, two in the mainland and five in the Great Sea. And there's seven continents in the world, they call it, right? Okay, so um, Ob willing, that was beneficial. I know that was a lot of information. It might take going over it a few times. And please feel free. If you have any questions, let me know. If you have anything that doesn't make sense or you don't agree with or you found something that is different, please share it. We're all learning, and I don't mind being corrected with multiple witnesses to prove a matter any more than you should. So thank you all for your time. You have a wonderful the rest of your Shabbat and a Shavuot Tov or good week ahead. Shalom.